Hi, I'm Matt Babcock of Babcock Hoops. Uh, I'm joined here today with our director of scouting, Derek Murray. Uh, we'll be answering some NBA draft related questions from some friends and followers. I uh, hope you enjoy. Thanks. Hi, guys. I'm Sam. I'm one of the co hosts of the Draft Dummies show. And I wanted to submit a question into this mailbag. And uh, something I've been thinking about, and something we all think about as talent evaluators or armchair GMs, as we like to call ourselves, are swing skills for these prospects. And something that just always stands out as you look up and down this class, just like every class, is that the jump shot is just a swing skill with like 75% of these prospects. So uh, my question is, if you could guarantee any prospect in this class that swing skill, uh, in other words, a jumper that's maybe slightly above league average, if you could guarantee that to any prospect in the draft, which prospect do you think that would benefit the most and change their evaluation the most? Hey, Sam, thanks for the question. That's a, that's a terrific question. Uh, and I agree with you. Outside shooting is is the most uh, most common swing skill for, for prospects at this stage. Uh, for this year's draft, I mean, there's one name that pops up clearly for me, uh, and that's Isaac Okoro from Auburn. Uh, you know, I think he's overall probably the best athlete in the draft, uh, best perimeter defender. I mean, 6'6", 225, can, can really just defend everybody. Uh, his outside shooting is just not quite there yet. Uh, if he's able to turn himself into, uh, you know, a, at least a decent outside shooter uh, where he's reliable to hit outside shots, uh, I think that, you know, I think they can really propel his career. And, um, you know, I think he's going to be a good player either way. Uh, but that's that's really the swing skill of what, you know, can make him you know go from being good uh, to being great. So thanks again. Hope, hope you're doing well. Hey, guys. So my question would be players that can create the most advantages on offense and mitigate them the most on defense are undeniably the most valuable players when it comes to winning. With this in mind, what is the most valuable archetype for advantage creation in the modern NBA? And which advantage creation traits are the most valuable uh, regarding the ones that are employed by this specific archetype or archetypes? So essentially, what traits do you need to be a volume advantage creator in the modern game? And which archetype or archetypes can accomplish this the most? What's up, Alex? Hey, thanks for the question. You know, you know me as well as anybody, and I think that 3 and D guys are incredibly valuable. You know, I love a guy who can defend and shoot on the wing, uh, both offense and defense, and there's a lot of value there. But what's really been on my mind a lot going into this draft class, especially after watching the bubble, is finding guards and lead guards who can drive an offense and create their own shot, as well as create for others whenever they need to. I think especially in Orlando, watching Devin Booker, uh, Donovan Mitchell, and Jamal Murray as of late just explode onto the scene, I think it really is telling how valuable those guys and that archetype is for teams right now. Um, the ability to drive an offense. And there are three guys in this class that I really like for different reasons. So I won't say there's necessarily one skill or one trait um, that I'm drawn to, but however you create space or create your shot is what I like. So the three guys come to mind, Killian Hayes, footwork. I mean, just developing uh, into a terrific shooter off the dribble, uh, developed a really nice step back jumper that's really fluid and you love to see that. Anthony Edwards' ability to create any shot he wants due to his athleticism, can stop on a dime, can elevate over anybody, good length, and just is a really tough shot maker. And the speed of Kyra Lewis Jr. just really stands out, can get around anybody he wants to. Um, the speed of the NBA game, you know, he might have to adjust and tweak some things, but his speed is real, and I think he's going to be able to create space for both himself and others. So I think, you know, to answer your question, the archetype, the thing that I like right now is a lead guard who can create space. I think that the ability to get your shot at the end of the shot clock, um, create for yourself, that's what really stands out and can drive winning basketball at the NBA level. What's up, guys? It's Gregory Blakely here. Um, my question for you guys is how hard do you think it is for NBA teams and NBA scouts to um, scout talent right now due to COVID-19? We're in unpre unprecedented times. And, you know, with the cancellation of the NCAA tournament games, less training sessions, and et cetera, um, I'm sure it's been hard for teams because, you know, a lot of people help their stock in the tournament games and a lot of people can drop their stock as well. And um, I'm just wondering what you guys think of 
how hard it is to scout this year's class? Uh, yeah, obviously this year has been been so unique and, and, and really challenging for all of us. Uh, you know, from a scouting perspective, uh, you know, and I, I feel like most most teams uh, are in a similar spot as we are um, in, in regards to you know during the year, early in the year. Uh, I mean, we hit hit the road hard. I mean, November is so so crucial with all of uh, you know double headers and, and tournaments and whatnot. So we really get ahead before you know, before Christmas even, uh, which takes some pressure off of conference tournaments and the NCAA tournament. Uh, granted, I mean, it's a good opportunity at that time of the year in March to see a lot of guys all at once. Uh, but I think you know, as far as on court talent, I think NBA teams have a good grip. I think what they're they're missing out on the most. Uh, are, are the in-person visits uh, where they're, they're bringing in p- prospects to their to their practice facility, um, take them to lunch, take them to dinner, uh, having them do individual workouts. Uh, that that's definitely definitely the, I think the biggest loss of this you know this year's pre-draft process. Uh, but you know I think we you know we've had so much time and the NBA teams have had so much time uh, to really dissect each each prospect. I, I don't think people are going to be going into the draft blind. Uh, so it's unique, uh, but it's you know it's not too problematic. Hello, Matt, Derek, the whole crew. Curious to know your thought process in deciding between uh, an elite role player and a star player with uncertain upsides. So that could be uh, questions regarding his character, his work ethic, or things of sort. What goes into uh, your thought process in deciding between those two potential draft picks? Josue, man, thanks for the question. And I love this one because this is the kind of question that you know GMs make their money on. Uh, it's really tough to... to decide what to do sometimes with certain picks in the draft. You know, a lot of organizations go into a pick and they think, you know, I need X, I need Z, you know, I need a role player because we're going to be a contender for the next two to four years. And I don't want somebody who's going to take the ball out of my star's hands. Other times it's, hey, I'm in a rebuild and I'm starting over and I need to pick the high ceiling, the young kid who we can hopefully build around the next 15 years. The important thing is to go into every pit completely open-minded. You know, don't box yourself into needing this or that specifically. You have to be fluid in your decision making. You know, if you're on the board and there's a role player that you're really targeting, and for some reason a potential star or potential high ceiling guy slips to you, you have to be able to decide within your organization in a short amount of time. You know, what's the value there? So I'm not going to try to tell a team, you know, hey, you should value. X over Z more, you know, that's their personal preference and whatever their methodology is, is up to them. But to your question, the important thing is to go in open-minded. Don't box yourself in. Don't limit yourself to, I need this particular player or position or archetype at this spot. Um, Cause that's how you can get into trouble. You know, you can end up really missing on some guys or leaving some talent on the table. So open-mindedness, um, being able to make decisions on the move quickly and fluidly, and really deciding the value between things at a given time is is a skill and eventually what makes people a lot of money. Hey guys, so my question is about the Minnesota Timberwolves. We've seen that they are open to trading their number one overall pick. What type of package do you think they're going after? Are they looking more for an established player or do you think they could trade back and just get extra picks? I'm interested to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, so with Minnesota, I you know there's two players that stand out to me in this year's draft that fit their team, and that would be Obi Toppin or Denny Avdia. I currently have them taking Obi number one on, on our mock draft. Uh, I don't think Obi, you know, if this were just a big board, would be in the number one spot, uh, but he is the best fit for Minnesota. So I, I do think they're going to be aggressive trying trying to move back uh, to maybe target one of these guys. And you know, one example I gave recently in a, in a different interview was, uh, you know, say, uh, say Cleveland wanted to move up, uh, who's picking at number five. Uh, you know, Minnesota could move back, ask for any kind of additional asset, whether it's another young player, uh, you know, another pick, future pick. Uh, any kind of trade sweetener, uh, I think it would be of interest to them because they could get a guy that would fit their team better than, let's say, Anthony Edwards, Lamelo Ball, or James Wiseman, uh, and, and get a guy like Obi Top and Denny Abdia, which they could plug them in uh, to their current team and roster uh, and kind of hit the ground running. Uh, the other part of the element of it, too, is, is worth noting is uh, you know, if they move down five spots, they would save $15 million over the course of the rookie contract. So uh, in a year like this where the top prospects – are pretty close in terms of you know who holds the most value. Uh, I, I don't think the packages are going to need to be extreme to move up because uh, you know the built-in sweeteners are in there with, with just the financial savings and uh, teams targeting guys that fit their team uh, rather than just take the best player available. So uh, we'll, we'll see how it unfolds, but I, I, I would expect Minnesota to be aggressive uh, to move that pick. I've seen mocks and big boards this offseason that has Vernon Carey going anywhere from mid-first round to undrafted. But I see in Matt's most recent mock draft, you have him going 29th. What is it about Vern's game that can either 
boom the NBA or bust? What's up, Drew? Thanks for the question about Vernon Carey. For for me, Carey's really interesting, and I think he has a really wide draft range because of what he brings to the court, at least in the immediate future. You know, with the modern NBA, bigs are stretching the floor more, they're shooting more, and with Carey, you know, he's a really good interior scorer and passer, but I don't know what he gives you right now as far as stretching the floor. You know, he hit that first three-pointer in the game earlier in the season, and a lot of people thought maybe this kid can shoot when at the end of the year, the volume just really wasn't there for us to buy that. So while he is big, you know, he's strong, he's physical, plays well on the interior, uh, on both ends of the floor. I just don't know if the switchability on defense or the ability to stretch the floor on offense is really there right now. So again, he's still young. He can get in much better shape than he's in right now. Um, Pretty good athlete. So I think with his size, athleticism, and the potential you have, I think he's worth a shot at the end of the first round, maybe the beginning of the second round as well. Um, but a lot of it will come down to how much organizations at their current draft spots value, you know, a more traditional center instead of somebody who maybe shoots or stretches the floor a little bit more. So that's going to be the biggest difference and what will ultimately decide the stock for Kerry. So I know the Thunder could go a few different directions in this draft if they kind of rework the rotation, maybe try to retool some guys, get some young guys on the floor again because they love the young dudes and they find them somehow. So if they wanted to, to get a new young guy and fit in, fit him into a place in the roster somehow, uh, who do you think that guy would be and what spot do you think he'd fill? Hey, the, the Thunder are in an interesting situation. Obviously, with Billy Donovan's departure to Chicago, uh, leaves their head coaching spot open. Uh, I'd be curious to see who they hire and you know what kind of style of play, uh, personality uh, that new coach would have and kind of bring to the team. Um, you know, as far as their their current makeup of their team, I, everything needs to be around Shea. I mean, his development recently uh, has been incredible, and uh, I think he needs to be the focal point of their team moving forward. Uh, obviously, Chris Paul, you know, came into OKC and uh, kind of shocked everybody. I mean, did really well, had All Star year, uh, and really helped the team uh, find some some success. However, you know, I don't think anybody expects him to be you know a big part of the long term plans for the Thunder. I mean, I could see him being traded as early as this offseason. Uh, and so really, as far as with the draft, um, you know, they've got a late first round pick uh, and they can go in a number of different ways. You know, uh, you know, whoever they add needs to be able to coexist with Shea, uh, but he's versatile. And, and so, I mean, he could kind of fit and, and blend and, and coexist with just about anybody. And so, I mean, they need to see who's there. I mean, some names uh, of guys that could be there, I think would, would be interesting would be uh, Elijah Hughes from Syracuse, uh, Jaden McDaniels from Washington, Cassius Stanley from Duke. Uh, or they go with one of the big guys, Zeke Najee, Jalen Smith. Uh, th- th- there's going to be some good options for them to add a piece that, that can kind of help them form their, their core unit moving forward. Uh, but we'll see how it goes.